Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for all for joining us on this discussion about FCC infrastructure rules and policy changes. My name is Louis Peretz. I'll, I'll be the moderator for this panel. I am the Vice President um, of Policy for WISPA. I joined WISPA in July of 2019. Prior to that, I served many years at the Federal Communications Commission. Most notably, I served about eight years as the wireless advisor to former FCC Commissioner Ming-Yan Clyburn. And now I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to my uh, panelists to introduce themselves. Courtney? Thanks, Louie and uh, WISPA for having us here today. Uh, my name is Courtney Neville. I am the Regulatory and Policy Counsel with STARI. STARI was founded in 2014, and since starting, we've developed two waves of our own millimeter wave technology and deployed an active broadband network in five cities, Boston, New York, DC, Denver, and LA. Uh, this panel is particularly important to Sari because our ability to succeed is directly tied to our ability to deploy equipment at specific locations and within a reasonable period of time. So happy to be here with you guys today to talk about the best ways to achieve that. Okay, Colin. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Colin Reed. I am the Vice President of Business Development at Common Networks, where I also oversee our government relations activities. Um, our company, Common Networks, we were founded in 2016. We are a venture-backed technology company and also a wireless ISP that provides residential service for both urban and suburban communities in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, we're specifically focused in the cities of Alameda and San Leandro. Um, and we've been really pioneers in using uh, the Terragraph technology stack. And while we kind of right size our frequency for the application, we use some sub six in our network, we're extensively using 60 gigahertz and a millimeter wave um, spectrum to provide up to 300 megabits of symmetric service for just $49 a month. And so as Courtney mentioned, this is something that's very relevant to us. Our deployment model is doing a residential rooftop deployment. So OTARD, um, is very top of mind for us and making sure that we understand the rules and regulations around that deployment. But then we also service several hundred uh, multi-dwelling units in the area um, where we are uh, both accessing prominently the rooftop space, but then also servicing customers in the MTE themselves. Okay, hey, thanks. Rob? Thank you, uh, Louis. Uh, my name is Rob Jackson. I'm uh, of counsel with the uh, uh, Tyson's Virginia law firm of uh, Marashlin and Donahue. I've been involved in telecommunications uh, law and policy since the uh, late 1970s. I was uh, both an attorney and an executive for US West, which is now part of uh, CenturyLink. I've worked with a number of large law firms, um, was on my, uh, ran my own private practice and have been affiliated with uh, Marashlin and Donahue since um, 19, uh, 2012. Uh, I've been heavily involved in all sorts of wireless uh, projects for uh, both in-house and uh, for clients uh, since the uh, early 1990s and was part of the original uh, team that helped set up uh, PCS PrimeCo, which is now a part of Verizon Wireless. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Rob. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so the purpose of today's uh, panel is to just give a general overview of the relevant types of regulations, both federal, state, and local um, involving antenna structures, wireless infrastructure. Also give a general overview of efforts of the FCC to streamline the process for allowing commercial wireless companies such as fixed wireless service providers to construct antenna structures and other wireless infrastructure. We're also going to focus on a few um, specific regulatory rule changes that we think could really help WISPs, such as the over-the-air reception devices rulemaking proceeding, the multi-tenant environment rulemaking proceeding, and the CTIA and WIA petitions for declaratory ruling. Next slide, please. So uh, it is general policy for WISPA to give this legal disclaimer on these presentations. Um, so the, the information that we're conveying to you folks today is not intended to create an attorney-client relationship. The information is general and not to be um, perceived to be legal advice. You are str strongly encouraged to consult your 
Um, can, attorneys, if you have specific questions about how these rules might apply to specific issues you might be dealing with. Um, and any reliance on this information today that we're presenting is taken at your own risk. Next slide, please. So um, there are four types of regulations that can affect the timing of deployment of wireless infrastructure for fixed wireless services. Um, there are the FCC rules to implement the National Environment Policy Act of 1969, or NEPA. Um, the FCC rules to implement the National Historic Preservation Act, or NHPA, and FCC rules to ensure towers do not impede aviation safety. There are also state and local government zoning regulations um, concerning siting and construction of antenna structures and other wireless infrastructure. Next slide, please. So this, we're going to give a, a little bit um, more detail about national um, the NEPA and NHPA regulations at the FCC. So generally speaking, um, formal reviews, and they can be very lengthy. The last job that I had at the FCC, I, I was focused on these um, quite ex extensively. Um, formal reviews under NEPA and NHPA are required when you want to construct a tower and an antenna structure. When that tower or structure is used to transmit over licensed spectrum, that's a very, I've, I've underscored it because it's very important for folks to understand these rules generally do not apply if you're using unlicensed spectrum, okay? Um, and, and, you're, and you're trying to construct an antenna structure. Um, and so it's, it's if, you're, if you have an antenna structure, um, it's being used to um, deploy signals over licensed spectrum, and if it meets any of the eight elements listed below. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but generally speaking, there are elements that could affect the environment, and there are elements that could affect historic properties. Uh, you, if you live in a in in in, in a town um, with historic properties, you'll probably know where they where they are. Um, but it also um, impacts. Um, it's it's also the NHPA. Both actually, both NHPA and and the NEPA rules, the environmental protection rules, and the historic preservation rules. Um, also apply um, if you're trying to deploy an antenna structure in a tribal land, such as a Native, Native American religious um, sites. Next slide, please. There's also um, FCC rules to protect aviation safety. So if a WISP plans to use a tower to transmit services and the tower over, it could, this, could also be, this could also apply to unlicensed um, spectrum and the tower is 200 feet or taller above ground level or with a specific distance from an airport, the WISP must regi register the tower with the FCC's antenna structure registration system and follow the Federal Aviation Administration or FAA rules. Um, the ASR program at the FCC also requires owners of antenna structures to obtain lighting and uh, obtain painting and lighting specifications from the FAA. Next slide, please. Okay, and I on, on this one, I, I will turn it over to Rob Jackson for his expertise. Oh, thank you, Louis. Uh, in my uh, spare time, I have been active in my community in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, just across the, uh, the, the river from the District of Columbia, and is um, doing a lot of land use uh, work for one of the largest and oldest uh, community associations in the county. So we've heard a lot of um, land use uh, applications to build various wireless towers. And zoning is, is very simply, it's, it's an exercise of the police power that's uh, generally upheld by courts. You divide land into zones, residential, industrial, certain land uses are permitted, some are prohibited, some are restricted, some are regulated. Um, the FCC has statutory authority to override or modify local zoning pro uh, powers when they are used to prevent or significantly impede the deployment of necessary infrastructure for wireless services. Short of that, local zoning authority is, is going to be protected. And it's been my experience that a lot of wireless deployments are slow or limited 
by a failure of the applicant to reach out to and work with the, the community groups. It's more than just submitting your paperwork to the city or the county or the state, whoever has authority in this area. Uh, most uh, areas in the, uh, especially in urban and suburban areas, have a community uh, or uh, associations or associations of homeowners, uh, uh, an umbrella organization for homeowners association. And quite often, the best way to get your project approved without community opposition is to reach out with them, contact them, make a presentation uh, to them. Early outreach and a willingness to address reasonable neighborhood concerns can often result in the successful expansion of infrastructure without the opposition and sometimes with the support uh, of the local community. It's, it's not saying to give them a veto uh, authority, but if you've got two sites that work equally well for you and one, uh, there's some concern about uh, view shed uh, and the other there isn't, um, it may make sense just to say, well, we could be flexible there. And uh, as, as we'll explain below, local zoning for over-the-air reception devices, or OTARs, is limited to safety issues. Thanks, Louis. Well, let me just ask a question, Rob. Um, uh, your experience on that residential council is, is very interesting to me because um, when I was with um, the FCC and, and, and advising Commissioner Clyburn, we actually uh, tried to broker a number of uh, best practices and um, agreements actually between CTIA and what's now known as the Wireless Infrastructure Association um, to help uh, local governments um, streamline the siting and approvals of applications. How important is it that um, wireless companies try to collaborate with um, zoning um, boards as well as with um, residential councils like such as such as the one that you you work with? Oh, absolutely, Louis. It, it's a good relationship with the staff, whether it's at the FCC or uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, or the city of Los Angeles uh, is important. They have professional staff people whose job it is to review these um, applications and to make sure they are compliant with, uh, with local rules and to have a good working relationship so that you understand, respect that their, uh, uh, what their obligations are under their state or federal law, but, but also let them know the benefits of this, uh, of this project, the fact that you have reached out to neighbors, you have looked at various alternatives, I think is very important. Great, and I and I know that um, there are a number of FCC commissioners who have said that the reason why they have been moving to stream to come up with rules that can help streamline um, local government approvals um, is because of the work of uh, a number of associations um, working with other uh, number of uh, wireless associations working with. Uh, associations that are actually um, designed to protect local governments like uh, National Association of Tower Owners and Association. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, Tower Owners of America, that's NATOA. And the fact that they were able to craft a number of areas where they thought um, FCC streamlining would work. And, and that's a perfect segue into the next slide, please. So between 2001 and 2018, the FCC actually adopted a number of measures to expedite the approval of wireless towers. And as I was alluding to before, FCC is looking for categories of structures and infrastructure that um, uh, working with uh, local governments and, and associations representing them has shown do not need extensive FCC environment protection or historic preservation review. Um, the first such effort began in, in about 2000, and it led to, in 2001, um, a pro nationwide programmatic agreement. Um, the FCC then followed it up in 2005 with another one that would um, exclude certain antennas that wanted to co-locate on buildings um, ex and did not substantially increase the, the height or width of the infrastructure. Um, Around 2012, the FCC started to really focus 
on what um, 5G deployments um, and, and, and very, very high speed um, uh, applications over millimeter wave uh, spectrum would look like. And as a result of that, they learned that um, the, the deployments for millimeter wave and 5G wireless technology would lead to a small cellular structure, architecture. Okay, um, and so they started in 2013 to understand what that, this would mean, and this would mean a lot more um, antenna structures or um, devices, reception devices and transmission devices that would be much smaller than the macro cells that have been traditionally used for um, commercial mobile uh, wireless services. So be between 2014 and 2018, the FCC looked for um, small wireless facilities and other type of equipments that, that were going to be much smaller than, um, as I mentioned before, prior deployments of macro cells, um, such as this, this, you know, these, the small cellular structures could uh, are sometimes called dis distributed antenna systems that meets um, certain height and volume limitations and location criteria. Now, in 2018, the FCC went really, really far, and they basically said that anything that meets the definition of a small wireless facility would be completely exempt, okay, um, from any type of environmental protection review and historic preservation review. The, the, uh, the DC Circuit, US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit said that on that particular um, streamlining attempt by the FCC, they went too far. Um, and they said that essentially um, the reason why the FCC went too far is because they did not justify um, how, um, why, why the FCC should just completely exclude um, these small wireless facilities. And in fact, looked at a lot of the um, prior decisions where the FCC said, okay, we're gonna maintain review over some small wireless facilities, but we're gonna exempt um, smaller ones. It seems like what the court was saying there is, you can't just simply take, um, uh, exempt all of these facilities from any type of environmental and um, historic preservation review. You have to exert some, some authority over that. Um, a lot of people in the industry were wondering what the FCC would do after the DC Circuit Court of Appeals decision. Um, and what the FCC actually did was say, well, they're not gonna try and justify it anymore. And they put out a rule about four months after that decision, essentially saying that it would repeal, repeal that rule. So that means the FCC is maintaining jurisdiction and there are gonna be some small wireless facilities that were not exempted from the 2014 and 2016 um, exemptions that the FCC gave that will have to go through environmental historic preservation review. Also in 2019, the FCC, upon the request of WISPA, initiated a rulemaking proceeding to amend the current over-the-air reception device rule to eliminate um, restrictions on hub and spoke installations. And we believe that the um, FCC has sufficient statutory authority to make these rule provisions. And as you'll learn more, um, as we delve into the details of the OTARD proposed rules, you'll learn more about exactly um, uh, how, how the, the type of uh, amendment that we're looking for there. And it's, it's actually quite broad. And we do believe that, this, that there's statutory authority for that. In, in 2019, the FCC also initiated a rulemaking proceeding to improve competitive broadband access to multi-tenant environments such as apartment buildings and condos. And again, we'll provide more detail on those proceedings um, as we go through this, uh, through the uh, presentation. Next slide, please. And now this is where I hand it over to Colin to explain the over-the-air reception device rule, rulemaking. Thanks, Louie. Um, yeah, so the over-the-air reception device rulemaking procedure was one that was kicked off last year. But before we jump into what the NPRM states, just a quick summary of what OTARD rules have been historically. Um, the original OTARD rule really applied only to antennas used to receive video programming signals. So this was something that was really meant to cover 
um, allowing uh, end users to get access to really TV and satellite signals in their home, the ability to put up a satellite dish um, for their own personal use. Since then, in 2000, the FCC expanded the rule to apply to all customer end antennas used for transmitting and receiving fixed wireless signals, which is really near and dear to um, the hearts of most WISPs here um, in the country. The rule covers antennas for fixed wireless that are less than one meter in diagonal, uh, I'm sorry, in diameter or diagonal measurement, that the antennas are, are located on property that is within the exclusive use or control of the user, and then finally that the antenna transmits and receives fixed wireless signals for those who uh, control the premises on which the antenna is located. So these are the general rules that will allow a WISP to go install a small antenna on a customer's home with the purpose of serving that customer. Um, one of the issues that we're encountering today as technology has increased the size of radio and antennas have decreased is that the OTARD rule does not currently apply to antennas that are operating as a hub or relay um, use case. And that actually has a lot of gray area because some of these antennas, it's hard to tell whether they are sending or receiving signal at any point in time. Uh, next slide, please. So in April of last year, the FCC issued a NCRM, which really proposed to eliminate the restriction that excluded these hub and relay sites from the OTARG rule. Um, in practice, this meant that most of the antennas that we use today that are one meter or less can be installed without local zoning review. So this rule does retain the exceptions for safety and historic preservation purposes. Um, and the NCRM seeks comment on the FCC's authority to actually extend the rule to cover uh, transmitting antennas and radios as well. Next slide, please. So from our perspective, um, for, from Common's perspective, we think that these rules um, will really streamline the, the, the rules of the game for fixed wireless siting. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a, a very subtle distinction these days between a transmission and a receiving uh, antenna. Um, it really can be the same device and the only the aesthetic impact on the community may be actually the exact same. The new antennas are small in size. The ones that we deploy on people's homes today are roughly the size of a dessert plate. So it's very small in, in terms of that diameter and um, size profile of it. And because we're using more millimeter wave um, and high frequency spectrum, we do need more line of sight. So we are going to see more of these antennas go up on people's homes. That's something that Common is actively doing is that we're putting up these antennas in, in a mesh type of topography so that whenever someone installs this on their home for their own use, um, not only are they installing it getting high speed access themselves, but it also extends our service area because we can use line of sight to see other rooftops and then install an OTAR compliant device on that rooftop to provide um, coverage and service that customer as well. So really what this does is it does create the fair rules for the game. Um, and it also creates the same you know, rules for all fixed devices. I think that's really important for WISPs. Uh, we don't have as deep of pockets as some of the large carriers who are deploying a lot of these antennas. Um, towers and erection of new towers are, can sometimes be much more costly. So from our perspective, being able to use some of these homes actually really reduces the economic burden on WISPs. And then most importantly, it actually provides predictability about these rules being applied. Um, city governments are certainly not experts on fixed wireless deployments. Um, in fact, the fixed wireless provider and a telecom provider oftentimes get grouped into the same classification by the city permitting offices. So there is a good amount of education that needs to take place when we go apply for permits or get clarity on what the permitting and regulatory procedures are. Um, oftentimes, I mentioned they do fall into a gray zone and this creates a lot of delays with the education process with their staff. And so really we think that creating these new OTARD rules, allowing that to cover hub and relay homes really will um, help create the proper rules of the game that we can all follow and make sure that we have um, no barriers now to this deployment and waiting for the permitting office to figure out how they're going to um, permit and, and restrict these types of deployments. Next slide, please. So 
uh, Common Networks has provided extensive initial comments on the OTART MPRM, which I can get into, but I will touch base on WISPA's comments. Um, they have asked the uh, commission to update the OTARD rule to apply to all fixed wireless transmitters and receivers, regardless of whether the equipment is used for reception, transmission, or both, so long as the equipment meets the existing side restrictions for the customer end equipment. Um, we think that this is a very uh, straightforward and logical expansion of this OTAR rule. And WISPA also mentioned that the commission pro can promote rural broadband deployment and enhance competition and lower barriers for these six wireless base stations by extending OTARD. And finally, WISPA did make the claim that the FCC has authority to preempt state and local restrictions on non-personal wireless um, facilities. So, um, Colin, this is Louis. Why don't, um, if, you, if you might, just cover or summarize what Common said um, in its comments uh, about the OTARD NPRM, it, to the extent that they're um, different. They may be different in certain ways, such as you know not focusing so much on rural broadband deployment. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we do um, suburban and urban deployments. We are primarily single family homes, so we do service several hundred multi dwelling units um, throughout our current markets. And really for us, we're trying to expand and grow very rapidly. And the issues that we run into is when we're servicing an area, sometimes the best way to um, get that coverage is using um, the residential areas inside and, and hub homes and relays. So it's something that we're actively looking at. But even without that, when we do go and deploy to service an area, we oftentimes end up using um, facilities that have good view sheds, so multi-dwelling units and things like that, where we can then set up um, a relay to actually go and service that neighborhood. When we set these up, we're always providing service to the tenants inside of that building. So a lot of these are covered under OTARD. The construction that we use is there actually really isn't any construction. It's a temporary kind of mast that we deploy using cinder blocks. Um, so we fit most of these requirements. But the issue that we run into is a lot of the permitting offices have no idea how to deploy this. And as a result, we'll get different answers depending on who is staffing the permitting office on whether we need to permit or go through any staff reviews or things like this. So we are seeing this um, quite a bit pop up. And so this is a big thing for us because as we move into new markets, even if we're still servicing the same area, but we want to set up a facility just outside the city or municipal borders, we run into this process all over again. And it really delays our deployment as we wait for a official ruling from that permitting office. So we believe that this vagueness needs to be addressed um, so that the rules of the game can be established and that we can definitely start covering these sites um, covered under OTARD protections and get these deployment out there as fast as possible so that we can start providing high-speed access to our customers. And um, when you talk about delays, Colin, like what, how many, you know, what are we talking about? A few months? six months how how long are some of the delays that you you've experienced when dealing with permitting offices yeah so we are a venture back company right so we need to use our capital as wisely as we possible possibly can and as we look to expand our service area not just within the san francisco bay area but into new markets and into new states this creates a tremendous um question mark for us in our timing of that deployment and the resources that we're going to devote to it um, we were looking to launch a new market in a different state um, as, as immediate as this first quarter of this year is when we plan to set up and start servicing customers. But what actually created the delay was we had to set up our network. And our network and, and the, the fundamental backbone of that network is something that we can deploy relatively quickly in a period of weeks, if not a few months. Um, and so we can deploy and really start servicing an area as, as quickly as four to six months from when we start our build. Now, the issue that we had is we didn't know from the city how were they going to treat these deployments. We're deploying on private property. We have contracts in place. We're going to provide service to those end users and then also service the area. Um, how are they going to zone it? What would be the, the process for the permitting? What are the legal costs? What's the administrative review? Um, oftentimes this can take six, seven, eight weeks for us to get through a staff review or get a permit pulled. That's a big time, especially if we're looking to deploy, you know, 20, 30 of these types of locations in a market very, very quickly. So without that certainty, 
it's actually caused us to have to put some of these new markets on hold. Um, the one market that I would talk to where we've finally gotten a ruling that they're not going to require a staff review or a permitting uh, procedure, that actually took them about seven to eight months to come back to us with that um, assessment. And so what that's actually done is pushed our deployment in this area out about three quarters, which means that the end um, effect on the customers is that's really a full-time, full one-year delay for us to actually deploy just because the city was trying to figure out what was the policy precedent? Are we a telecom? Should they view us as a 5G mobile provider? Um, do we need to have um, staff reports, you know, in addition to structural analysis and things like that? There was just a lot of process there where if we had deployed capital, we would have had our, our field technicians and our network deployment team really sitting around waiting for the opportunity to start our deployment. Wow. That sounds like an awful lot of delay um, and an awful lot of procedural hurdles that you shouldn't have to go through. Uh, are, do, you, do you think that some, maybe if you have competitors like from the cable um, industry or other folks that um, you might consider um, competitors, do you think they get involved with the permitting process and, and, and that, to create more obstacles um, for your, against your deployment, to prevent your deployment? I would say that we've seen competition get involved in the permitting process, per se. Um, what we have seen in certain states and jurisdictions are really large telecom providers try to institute laws and regulations to help expedite um, 5G mobile deployments. And what that does then is you know, it creates a policy environment where the municipalities and the state comes together where they get fixated on one type of use case and, and particularly the small cell use case, which have very different power, construction, and, and size requirements than what we were deploying. So as a result, they start creating these um, regulations to actually help spur and foster the deployment of these 5G deployments. But again, these deployments are meant for the large carriers that are deploying hundreds of these locations in a certain city, um, have the, the time and resources to wait and, and go from there. So when a small WISP comes in saying we want to use the same things, some of these rules oftentimes um, prohibit our ability to deploy in certain areas. I could say in one state that we're looking at, they've allowed um, shot clock rules and those things for 5G deployments in the right of way for the permitting and that type of process. But as a result, they've actually specifically excluded city and municipally owned assets as areas for um, carriers to deploy. So in that scenario in itself, we're actually now having to go back to the city and municipality. So we, we applaud you for your proactive stance on these 5G deployments for mobile purposes. But when it comes to fixed wireless, you know, there is a bias designation from the FCC. There's different things. Some of these rules are actually onerous and prevent us from our, our types of deployments. So, Louie, I, I don't think that the um, competition, so to speak, is trying to intentionally get involved in a negative way in the permitting process. But I think when you start having uh, local jurisdictions, um, and government entities start trying to figure out how to deploy this and create these rules, and they start classifying all different types of wireless providers together, it creates a lot of confusion in the marketplace um, that sometimes are, are not to the benefit of WISPs. Got it. Excellent. Um, uh, I would like to um, turn it over to Courtney and Rob to see if they have any insights. I know that um, Starry also filed comments in this proceeding. Yeah, thanks, Louis. So um, similar to what you, both you and Colin have said, this proceeding has been one of the proceedings that Starry has been more active in. We also filed comments asking the FCC to modernize its rules to apply to all fixed wireless transmitters and receivers so long as the equipment meets existing size restrictions and complies with safety restrictions and the exceptions for um, historic and environmental review as you laid out. We really believe that the more streamlined approach that both you and Colin mentioned could improve connectivity 
especially in urban areas where capacity can be a bit more dense um, and also empower the state and local authorities to enhance competition in their communities. Um, you know, Louis, your WISPA comments mentioned, and we agree that this is a pretty transparent modification to the OTAR rules, and it could really have a meaningful impact on accelerating broadband deployment for consumers. So um, we're definitely all in agreement here. So, you know, this is Colin, and I just add, when we look at some of our suburban areas, you can think about the suburban residential sprawl and I, I would I would point out that zoning differs from city to city, but some of the areas that we're currently serving are areas that are completely zoned for residential. There's no MTEs in this area. There are no commercial or industrial buildings there that we can deploy on. And so what we end up doing is setting up relay sites on the outside of these residential neighborhoods. But what that does is it prevents us from getting the density in the neighborhood. So I would say that in some of our markets, we have residential areas where we want to service these customers. We have the majority of these populations have raised their hand saying, I want new internet service, but there's really no way for us to get the coverage assets without either using an existing tower, which you know can be $20,000 or more to get that deployment up and running with power, or to construct our own tower, which has substantial delay. So in these areas, being able to actually use a residential home to not only service that customer with OTAR, but also then use that as a as a relay point is actually critical in enabling us to provide the service to that entire community. So we have a lot of examples where this is really a big deterrent, not just from a time perspective, but also just a, a economic deterrent for us being able to provide service. Interesting. Uh, uh, Louis? If I might add a point, uh, a couple years ago, I worked with a, uh, a WISP in a, a totally opposite environment. Uh, it is an area uh, of uh, ex-urban Virginia and uh, where broadband internet access just wasn't there. And um, the, um, the, the client uh, saw that need and went and spoke with the uh, uh, the, the staff and then with the board of supervisors, which got very excited about it and started working uh, with uh, the Virginia Department of Transportation, uh, which controls all roads in Virginia, and the local co-op power company, and they worked out ways that they could start getting these uh, um, OTAR devices in a hub and, and uh, relay system uh, in parts of the county and just the total opposite attitude. We need this. Our people need this. We can make it work. And uh, they had incredible progress uh, within uh, about nine months. Wow, that's great. Um, that's a, that sounds like a real success story. And so I think with, thank you, uh, everyone, for your um, excellent presentation and, and explanations of, you know, how the o OTARD MPRM proceeding, if if the F FCC adopts our proposed rules, could help WISPs deploy. So I think that concludes our OTARD presentation, unless somebody else has something else to say uh, on this point. Another one of our panelists might have something. If not, then um, I will, next slide, please, and I'll turn it over to Courtney to explain the multi-tenant environment proceeding. The only thing I would add, Louis, is uh, to Rob's point about that county, and we would like to applaud those counties that take that initiative. Um, but the question that comes to mind is, what about the counties right next to it? You know, what would be the experience of someone that lived right on that county border that needed that service? Um, and I think that's just another proof point as to why OTART is important, because if this was adopted and it wasn't county by county, we would create more streamlined deployment um, rules and, and remove those barriers. I would agree. Okay. Does anybody else have something they'd like to point out about OTART? All right. Um, Courtney? Thanks, Louis. Um, so starting off on the multi-tenant environment MTE or MDU slide, um, Louis mentioned at the outset that the goal of this proceeding from the FCC's perspective is 
to improve broadband competition, particularly in apartments and condominiums. In the NPRM, which was released in 2019, the commission sought comment on a variety of issues that could affect deployment in these multi-tenant environments, including seeking more information and comment on exclusive marketing and wiring agreements, um, which can often also include revenue sharing agreements and also some state and local regulations that might be in place as related to this proceeding. Starry and um, I'm sure most of the WISPA membership appreciate the FCC's effort so far to sort of streamline these barriers. And I will note that Starry in particular really prides itself on the partnerships that we have in place with many property owners and managers in the cities in which we're deployed. Um, most of this is done through negotiated access agreements, and so we've found that there are some obstacles that remain that are particularly pertinent to this proceeding. Um, let's go to the next slide and we can talk about WISPA's comments and Starry's advocacy in particular. Please. So um, WISPA filed comments, they noted that, and the FCC's NPRM actually acknowledged as well, that MTEs present unique challenges to deployment, particularly for WISPs. From Starry's perspective specifically, we also filed comments and noted that the majority of our subscribers live in MDUs. These buildings often literally represent the last sighting hurdle. They can be the last 100 feet where um, some incumbents can still wield monopolistic power to prevent competition. And they're actually a really unique deployment use case um, for a couple of reasons. The first is that installing facilities inside of MTEs is often complicated and expensive because providers must access building conduits and lay wire that can reach each unit in the building and also make necessary repairs once the wiring is installed. Another reason this is particularly challenging is because when you think about it, broadband deployment to MTEs actually involves three parties rather than the usual two. There's the broadband provider, the end user tenant, and the controlling party or premises owner, all of whom must take some coordinated action for deployment to occur. And then the third, which is probably the most popular sort of soundbite in this proceeding, are these types of exclusive agreements that we talked about on the outset, which can affect marketing and actual wire pulling and sometimes stunt conversations between these three entities. So WISPA and Starry and others on record filed comments and have advocated that the FCC prohibit the use of these exclusive provisions and help to level the playing field for competitive alternatives to broadband. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. We can dig a little bit more into these agreements that we discussed. So as I mentioned, Starry is really proud to partner with a lot of our property owners and managers. We have great relationships there and gaining access to MDUs is not impossible, but it can be challenging, especially when these agreements are in place. The first, as listed, are exclusive marketing agreements. We found that 100% of MGUs with 50 or more rental units often have these types of marketing arrangements or revenue arrangements in place with an incumbent provider. The speaking point there, other than the fact that they exist, is just that many of these agreements often contain some overly restrictive language that can leave building owners and managers with the impression that they cannot enable another competitive alternative or service in their building and that if they do, they might face litigation from the incumbent provider. Talking about wiring agreements, these enable the incumbent provider to have exclusive use to some what's called home run lines in the buildings, often for set terms of 10 to 15 years or more. And the incumbent often assumes the cost of pulling and wiring fiber. The property developer often does not make provisions for neutral wiring, and the net result is effectively an exclusive service agreement for that incumbent, and um, unfortunately a captive consumer base that might have no say in who's providing their internet access. And then lastly, this isn't listed here, but it's sort of an overall theme that we've experienced that 
um, I mentioned before, the mere threat of litigation or the potential for litigation is often an effective deterrent for building owners and managers to looking at a competitive alternative to broadband. Um, while a lot of these agreements smartly don't contain sort of that type of legal language, um, we found that additional education could be helpful, which is one of the reasons that we think this proceeding at the FCC is so important. Um, and then mainly, just as Starry's overall approach, we think there are a lot of public interest benefits that could result if these sort of tailored policy changes are made and the, the clarifications are provided by the FCC. The first is, of course, connecting more consumers. Um, we estimate that we'd experience a 25 to 30% increase in deployment if the rules are streamlined in the OTARD and MTE products. And that's just this year, which is a pretty astounding number. Um, and then the second is, of course, continued empowerment by property managers and owners to attract new tenants and provide um, competitive broadband alternatives for their tenant. I know my building in particular is, is a good example of this. They're actually uh, experiencing some exclusive marketing agreements as well and are starting to market a competitive broadband alternative as a new amenity for tenants, which is really attractive, especially as consumers are working more from home and trying to connect with families. And, you know, we've seen now in this current COVID-19 pandemic, there's also an extensive need for telehealth and that connection is even more important now. So we think it's really important. We hope the FCC will move on this quicker, sooner rather than later. Um, and that's where we are on that. <laughs> Excellent presentation, Courtney, thank you. Um, so um, you mentioned that uh, if the FCC could could remove um, some of these anti-competitive agreements that would be really helpful in a time of emergency, such as you know the COVID-19 um, pandemic that we're dealing with, are there beyond that one, um, and just the, the mere fact that <laughs> there should be more competition throughout um, markets, um, are there any other public interest benefits that you um, might want to identify uh, that could benefit that that could that could result from the MTE proposed rules? Yeah, that's a great question, Louis. So just to hone in a little bit more on the first part, um, because we are a broadband only provider, our customers are usually 100% cord cutters. So we're really accustomed to seeing heavy data usage, which means that. Our network, fortunately, the use that we've, the increase in traffic that we've seen over the last few weeks as people are working more and more from home is in line what we are usually anticipating. That being said, um, streamlined deployment procedures, both OTARD and MTE, and we'll talk about Section 6409 later, um, you know, are really useful. Our guys are on the ground trying to deploy to help sustain the capacity that we're experiencing and um in addition to that like i said earlier our conversations with property owners and managers they're also looking to um you know attract more of the younger consumer base and tenants and clarifying and making a more uniform regulatory regime if the fcc is able to do that through this proceeding can certainly um address these remaining obstacles to deployment and spur competition both in the market and then in these buildings as well. And if I could just ask you this question, um, sure. if you, I mean, because you know, you've been following um, FCC proceedings for many years and you yes. know how they typically will tee up in a, in a rulemaking proceeding like a dozen issues and really just address six, right, in the first right. order. Which which of these agreements do you think are the ones that Whisper really needs to push the FCC to um, remove? Which are the top like three in your opinion? That's a great question. So um, talking about FCC rhetoric for a second before I answer the meat of your question, there's always <laughs> the rural digital divide, which of course is very real. But there's also a remaining urban digital divide, which is why this MTE proceeding is so important for Starry. And I think maybe the top three um, provisions that 
sort of stunt deployment in these MTEs are the exclusive marketing and revenue sharing and exclusive wiring. Rooftop access is also really important to us, so I'm being greedy here and talking about all of them, but Starry sees deployment strategy, all vertical assets as an opportunity to deploy when possible and when reasonable. Um, so I think if the FCC could really tackle the exclusive marketing and wiring agreements and then clarify the rooftop access um, sort of point in the proceeding and then also clarify that litigation is not necessarily a force that can be used to sort of advance these types of exclusive arrangements and that would be really, really useful. So tying it all up, exclusive marketing, addressing that, um, clarifying rooftop access and underscoring that um, litigation is not as an effective as not as effective and a deterrent as it's often used to be. Excellent. I'm taking notes, by the way. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> for for next steps of our advocacy. So um, I love Colin, that. I my ears. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Colin. Um, how about you? Which are the top two or three, in your opinion, that the FCC needs to focus on in terms of these uh, agreements? Thanks, Louie. And Courtney, Courtney, fantastic job there. Um, I'd also like to commend Sari on their responses to the FCC and this NPRM and some of the innovative proposals they put forward. We are, we're very much supportive of Starry and their positions here. Um, I can go on about some of these exclusive marketing and revenue share and exclusive wiring things. I think Courtney did a very good job of discussing those and, and some of the lease uh, kind of buyback provisions type of, of things that go on in these MPEs. Um, but I would say, you know, just broadly, all of these have the effect of favoring one provider over the other. And when we think about economics, it, it makes it very difficult for someone to try and wire a building or try and enter a building when we can't do exclusive, I'm sorry, when we can't actually market maybe the name or the picture of the building or anything like that to those tenants. So it, it's the cost benefit analysis going in the MTE sometimes get definitely um, uh, swayed negatively by some of these, these agreements. Um, and the other hard part here is that we don't get access to the actual agreements. So we're oftentimes listening to the property manager um, who says anecdotally that we have an exclusive agreement or exclusive marketing, and they may not even understand the full scope of that agreement. I would say for common though, one of the biggest issues in this MTE um, NPRM was actually rooftop access. And if you, if you think about why that is so important to us, it kind of goes back to your city planning um, classes that you've probably taken and local zoning. So when we think about the main roads and arteries of the city where you see a lot of fiber, those are surrounded by commercial and industrial buildings. When you start going to the surface streets, you know, you see a blended uh, mixed use type of environment. And when you start thinking about, think about sprawling suburbs and those types of areas, right behind those surface streets, you usually have a row of apartments and commercial buildings and mixed use. And then you have big, huge residential areas that all have residential streets, um, 25 miles an hour, and just, you know, single family homes. You know, going back to some of the OTAR discussion, we need the line of sight to go in and cover some of these residential areas. So what's great about multi-dwelling units is their actual location from a zoning perspective for some of these mixed use facilities. Multi-dwelling units are usually found on busy surface streets in these residential communities, the main, the main streets in these, in these cities. Um, they're typically taller and have lower, you know, have different zoning requirements, so they can be taller than a single family home, which provides them amazing view shed of these residential areas. So that is critical for us to service the residential communities, let alone the actual tenants of these um, multi-dwelling units. So the height is, the unobstructed line of sight from the height is huge for millimeter wave. Next is their adjacency to densely populated areas. As I mentioned, they're on surface streets and right behind them are typically residential neighborhoods and residential areas. So these MPEs are actually the perfect place for us to locate some of our um, equipment to service the residential community in addition to serving the tenants of that MTE. But I'd say perhaps the biggest thing about multi-dwelling units is the fact that they're located on these surface streets and not on residential streets means that you typically have fiber 
to the building or very near by the building. So that makes these multi-dwelling units and their access to fiber not just critical for being a relay, but also critical for being our fiber source to serve these communities. And I would flag that when it comes to rooftop exclusivity, this is not something that we see often in a marketplace. Um, we've seen very few examples of this actually occurring. So the fact that this is still allowed is, is kind of a head scratcher. But when we do see it, we see it predominantly on some of the biggest, tallest MDU buildings. We've seen contracts that are 10, 15 years has been disclosed to us anecdotally. And if we can't deploy there and service their tenants, the issue that, that's at stake here is we can't now service those residential communities just due to some of the zoning laws in these areas. So I'd say that this rooftop exclusivity piece is perhaps one of the biggest deployment um, barriers for us to give residential service. And oftentimes in the case of these examples, we're talking about hundreds of homes, thousands of potential customers that are now without a viable broadband alternative or a high-speed um, solution. So I'd say from Commons' perspective, the rooftop exclusivity is perhaps one of the biggest barriers to creating the true um, broadband deployment in these types of areas. Colin, I agree with you. And um, Louis, if I may just jump in again and jump, Absolutely. jump off of what Colin said. So at the end there, you were talking about having the ability and line of sight to provide consumers with a viable broadband alternative and or broadband generally. Um, and on that point, Starry has also launched a program called Starry Connect, which is a program that offers a free or lower cost service to consumers in public and affordable housing communities. Um, we've partnered with several housing in the, in the cities where we've deployed, including Boston and Denver, and we're also um, a HUD Connect Home USA stakeholder. And in addition to broadband, affordable and reliable broadband rather being a lifeline for some consumers especially those in these communities um i think louis in the wispa comments you mentioned that broadband only households are going to spike to over 40 million in the next sort of five years i think is the prediction which is going to be over a third of the country so having these more streamlined procedures in place and clarity on where the rules stand at the federal and state and local level will be really helpful to bridging the divide in both rural and urban areas. I agree with you. Rob, did you have any insights from your um, you know, residential council um, experience or from uh, as being a lawyer that you'd like to share? Well, about uh, thank you, Louis. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what to say here because uh, I have uh, represented a number of uh, real estate developers over the years um, negotiating some of these uh, preferred provider uh, agreements with people, and I've worn the other hat and, and tried to uh, un, uh, you know, loosen these up and, and, and challenge them. But the, the, the one issue I will comment on is, is I think that there are some more – the exclusive marketing, I, I appreciate it. Um, I think that there, there's, there might even be sort of a, a, a constitutional issue here if you let me play lawyer for a while, in that it, it's um, a, a situation where um, you have a right not to speak. And I think that if, if the, say the HOA, or um, especially in an HOA situation where you've got condo owners, um, I think maybe they have a, a, a right to uh, uh, not not allow uh, uh, marketing um, that uh, is uh, against what they're, they've signed their uh, preferred provider arrangement. Uh, I think it's very tough to do anything exclusive nowadays, uh, but I, I think a preferred provider is a, is a tough one to beat on that issue, and I'll I'll stop there. Okay, Colin or um, Courtney, I don't know if you wanted to respond to Rob's comment. Yeah, I'll just say, um, totally take the point, Rob, and I agree that it, there is certainly a choice there for the property owner and manager. Um, I think I mentioned that Starry is really proud of the relationships that we formed with our property managers, so um, completely agree that fostering a good relationship and 
keeping the lines of communication open is really essential to making sure deployment is ubiquitous and easy on both ends. Um, from our perspective, though, just some further clarity from the commission, I think, could be useful both for the siting provider and for the reviewing party. Okay. Um, Clarification is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, if there, does anyone else, would anybody else like to um, add a few more thoughts on this proceeding? If not, then we'll move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so I'll, I'll handle this slide. Um, Louis, do we lose you? Yeah, I was having technical difficulty there. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Okay, sorry about that. Um, um, I'm going to handle this slide on the efforts to expedite state and local government permitting of towers. So I, I discussed earlier on in the presentation the FCC's efforts to streamline their own review of um, the siting and construction of communication towers. Um, the, the, this next portion of the demo, of the presentation and the last one. We'll be talking about efforts to uh, to streamline what state and local governments have been doing. Um, so, I mean, we've been talking about OTAR, that was one example, but there are others as well. So, um, in the 2009 FCC declaratory ruling, the FCC interpreted Section 332C7, it's an important aspect of the Communications Act, to determine that 90 days would be a reasonable period of time for localities to review and act on either by approving or denying um, co-location applications. So this is an application to just put another antenna on top of a tower, <laughs> on top of a uh, building or a, a tower um, that already has an antenna. And we also determined in the, at the FCC, or the FCC or, um, also determined that 150 days is a reasonable time frame for them to review um, and approve other types of um, complete applications to place, construct, or modify uh, wireless facilities. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, Rob, I think I'm handing this one off to you to explain Section um, 6409 and the petitions for declaratory ruling from CTIA and Wireless Infrastructure Association. Okay, thank you, Louis. Um, I think anyone in the wireless business knows about Section 6409 of the, uh, actually it was a tax bill, but everyone in our industry calls it the Spectrum Act. Uh, again, it was Congress speaking that state and local government uh, must you uh, approve certain wireless broadband facility sightings for modifications and co-locations. Um, in a way that does not, uh, if it does not um, provide a substantial change to the physical dimensions of the tower or the base station. I, I think uh, we've had some examples before of, you know, this is just like the same as what you're doing across the street, um, or in, but you're, you're starting as if you've never seen one of these. And um, I think Congress was a good thing to step in, and a number of states have stepped in too, but again, more especially as it relates to 5G. In October 2014, the FCC um, unanimously approved rules uh, interpreting Section 6409A, and they created a 60-day shot clock within which the localities must act to uh, on complete applications subject to the definitions in the Spectrum Act. And again, Again, part of that, I'll go back to what I said earlier about zoning. It's it's probably good there if you've reached out to the community, found out if there are any issues, and, and told that they could address those. Um, next slide, please. Um, w, CTIA and WIA um, have uh, experience because again there, there are jurisdictions that that work well within the spirit of the rules and those are that that don't they drag their feet they try to create obstacles where there shouldn't be 
And CTNA and WIA ask that any excavation within 30 feet of a tower site qualifies for relief. The shot clock begins to run when the applicant makes a good faith effort to request local approval. I mean, again, if, if one little attachment is, is was filed two days later, you don't start the clock all over again. Localities should not establish processes or impose conditions that effectively defeat or reduce the protections afforded by 6409. And again, some of them do. You, you see these court cases all the time. Um, they don't want anything wireless, any facilities within their community, but they want the service. If a siting application uh, fails to act timely, um, the application is deemed granted and you begin to construct even if the locality has not issued uh, related permits. And a um, FCC asked, issued a public notice seeking comment on that, uh, those uh, petitions. Next slide, please. Uh, WISPA was uh, actively involved in this proceeding and um, because they point out that they too, not just, uh, you know, the the uh, T-Mobiles and uh, AT&Ts and Verizons of this world, uh, WISP require access to towers, buildings, uh, water tanks, etc. cetera. Uh, WISPs get the same similar regulatory barriers uh, to re restrict or delay access by large wireless companies. Uh, and, but they don't have the resources. WISPs are generally pretty small, and uh, they could, uh, something that AT&T can afford to do, uh, a small WISP might not be able to do it, and they might have to walk away from a market which hurts competition and consumer welfare. WISPA's uh, members uh, put up some of these examples um, to deploy this, and they urge that the uh, that there be relief from the FCC, that there needs to be some consistent set of rules that make this process work. You know, again, I had the example where the Board of Supervisors out in a, in a rural uh, uh, Virginia County have jumped on to board to work with everyone to get this going, but there's a lot of places that don't. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I turn it back to you, Louis. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, so Courtney or Colin, I don't know if either of you have any insights on um, uh, on these proceedings and these rules that were meant to um, streamline the process before states and, and local jurisdictions. If you do, um, would you like to offer those insights? So I'll start off. Um, Starry has been a little bit less active on record on this proceeding. We're, of course, still monitoring it because um, it's another notch in the belt of areas where the FCC and other policymakers can take some good action to help streamline barriers. I will say that I agree with Rob that a consistent set of rules across the board, and in particular in this area, um, will allow providers to better use and organize the limited resources that they have and make sure that they're targeting deployment to consumers that need it most, whether that be in urban or rural areas, and make sure that they're adequately using um, the resources that they have for that mission. Yeah, so this is Colin from Common. Um, you know, we don't do a lot of tower deployments, but we do do some. Um, and typically for those, we do have to go through the permitting process. And I would applaud some of these, these efforts that have gone on, the shot clocks and things like that. I would flag, though, that even with some of these permitting issues, some of the biggest issues that we see when we deploy on, on towers and these other vertical assets is actually pulling power and the other processes around um, actually being able to go up and co-locate on there, making sure we have the right meter, if there's any fiber that needs to be pulled. And some of those permits and processes actually take a very long time and can be very, very expensive. So while we definitely applaud these, we think that this is a good first step. We think there's more that can be done here to reduce that deployment cost. And I think at some point here, we do have to start um, discussing what the power concerns are and how those create even more additional barriers to tower deployments. 
kind of open up Pandora's box, but something we run into all the time here. Great. And Rob, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to say. Um... Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, one of the things that I think is real important is, is if you can bring uh, drawings of what people's gonna, people are going to see, et cetera, when, when both when you meet with the local staff and, and otherwise. Uh, we have an example that, that, you know, our community association uh, looked at something and uh, it was a, a, a basically to put a, another 10-foot extension on a, uh, on a utility pole and put a, uh, an antenna on there. And um, for the life of me, I, I drive by this uh, pole, um, you know, probably five times a week. I'd never bothered to look at it. I mean, a lot of this stuff is is perception, and I think that if if you can show what's there, you can show that this device is, you know, a meter. Um, more of the reasonable people are going to say, you know, really, that's not so bad. That's just a, a side comment. Okay, thank you very much, um, everyone. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you have any closing remarks or other points that you'd like to make, but I'd, um, I'd, I'll give you an opportunity to make them now if you'd like. If not, I can just um, close, close our presentation. It's up to you. Okay. Um, so I just want to thank um, Courtney, Colin, and, and Rob for taking time out of their busy schedule. Uh, again, we're we're all living through a historic um, pandemic right now. Um, it's it's crea creating um, um, additional burns on all of us and and all of your companies. And I do appreciate the time that you spent today here. I hope that the our audience will appreciate um, the expertise that was demonstrated in your presentations. I know that I do, and so I just want to thank you again for taking time to help and. And thank you very much always for your support of WISPA. Thanks, Louie. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Bye.